Good afternoon, everybody. I am very pleased to be doing a live interview, an exclusive live interview with James Burke. If you were old enough to see men walk on the moon and you lived in England, James Burke was the anchor man who told you what you were seeing. Uh, he is the presenter and writer of a number of popular series, including Connections, the original. There's Connections 2. There was Connections 3. And also The Day the Universe Changed. I own all the DVDs, but you can find most of these programs on Daily Motion and YouTube. Uh, he's also the author of a dozen books, and if I kept reading his bio, we'd run out of time in fairly short order. So um, we're going to talk about a number of topics today, and naturally COVID is going to be among them. And the information that we have about COVID seems to change almost daily, but lest the viewers think it unreasonable for me to ask James to make predictions about uh, a pandemic that's uh, evolving rapidly, I want them to understand the gift that he has for anticipating the future based on an incredibly detailed knowledge of history. So to drive that point home, I'm going to show a brief clip from the original Connection show. And it has nothing to do with pandemics, but it demonstrates the ability of our guests to analyze patterns and foresee future developments. Now, I want you to bear in mind that this clip aired over 40 years ago in 1978. So let's take a look. This shape is the shape of our future because the only way the money can move around fast enough to keep up with trade is electronically, from bank to bank, through computers, or in the case of you and me, through this, the credit card. This is you coded into that magnetic tape. See? In there is the world's newest virtue, credit worthiness. Are you a good risk or not? And what people need to know about you before you can become a coded signal on that stripe makes this much more than a substitute for money. It's a judgment on you. And that's why here, where they make credit cards, the security is so tight. Because you steal one truckload of credit cards and you've practically got the key to, oh, every bank in the country. The question is, is any security tight enough? As the data on you and your credit flows from bank to shop to employer to police to tax inspector, what happens to privacy? And if you don't want credit, how do you live in a world where they don't take cash? What will happen? when being in debt all the time is the normal way to live. So uh, I want to bring James out on camera now and uh, address that clip. Hi, James. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for joining us from Europe, where I know it's uh, much later on in the day. Um, right. About that clip, these were incredibly prescient points that you raised uh, before the existence of PayPal or Venmo, identity theft, debit cards, or cashless shops, uh, all of which are explicitly predicted or hinted at very strongly in what you said over 40 years ago. So I want the viewers to take note that uh, my questions asking you to predict things are not unfair given your track record. Um, but now that we've got that out of the way, uh, let's just get started. Let's talk about the Black Death. Um, one of the fascinating things you talked about in your programs, and I'd like you to briefly recap, is how the plague affected the value of labor and also how it created a demand for what Americans would call notaries or registrars. Well, I guess the most important thing to say about the Black Death was that it, it hit a society that had been structured in that way for several hundred years it was a we were a t it was a time with no telecommunications very little communication systems of any kind well over 95 percent of the population would have been illiterate people 
really went further than eight or nine miles from their home because you had to be back at night before dark because there was no light. So the country really operated on a system, social system, that had been in, in immovable existence for hundreds of years. And that really boiled down to land work. There was no, apart from, apart from artisans like iron workers, smithies, uh, people who would paint your house, craftsmen, if you like. 90% of the population lived on the land, worked the land. It was an agricultural society, not an industrial society. And what the time, what happened was at the time, the situation was that you worked as a, well, kind of a serf. Uh, you, you, you belonged to the aristocrat who owned the land and in whose house, little house somewhere on the land, you lived, you were allowed to live. And that was your lot for your entire life. The plague decimated the population. I think that the guess, the guess for England alone, that for Europe alone was 25 million people. Wow. Um, so the population went down by between 1.2 1, 1 and two thirds. Um, an incredible shock to the system because an agricultural society lives on the effort of its laborers and now there weren't any. So the first thing that happened was that the laborers were so rare that the relationship between them and the aristocrats changed radically and it stopped being one of permanent servitude and started being cash. It started being wages or rental. And the worth of every laborer, of course, was immensely more now because there were fewer of them. I mean, the production of food, the agricultural use of the land dropped like a stone. So the aristocrats who owned the land were instantly poorer. And now they also had laborers who could kind of say, this is my wage and this is what I want. If you don't want me, I'll go to somebody else. Never before possible. So the whole of society radically changed. And because of the new interaction, new contractual relationships, if you like, between aristocrat and laborer, <coughs> the importance of contractual relationship became. And that's where this business of the notaries suddenly becoming extremely important. Everybody had to have some kind of deal or the man would walk off the land and go and work for somebody else. So none of this, at least for a hundred years, pushed very hard towards technological alternatives because that depended on many other factors which weren't present at the time, like steam power, for example. Um, so the best, the best you could do really was to try and persuade as many laborers as you could to accept the wage that you could give them and have them go on working your land the same old way. Gradually, things began to change because gradually technological novelties began to arrive and help society adapt in a new way to this lower population. But that's it in a nutshell. And you also needed those notaries, notaries or clerks to handle inheritance paperwork. Handle? In, uh, inheritance paperwork, because so many people were leaving inheritances. Well, the, 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 the problem in, in, throughout history is always who gets what when people die. I mean, you know, marriage in the third millennium BC in Mesopotamia is, in, is instituted to make sure that land remains in the same, hands of the same people, same family. So a woman brings her dowry into a family and it remains there in order to help pay for the continuing ownership of the land by that family. Um, uh, men go out, but they get women and come back with them as wives. So they always remain with the family. So institutions are set up to make sure that happens. And the contractual obligations were terribly important at the time. So as, as far as labor and the importance of people who are working the land, we've We've already seen a repeat of this right now in America where the government has classified seasonal or migrant uh, farm workers as essential um, because if the crops aren't harvested in time, uh, they will wither on the vine, they'll rot, and there'll be a disruption in the supply of the food chain. Uh, on the flip side of that, we also now know that many people could actually work from home who previously had been working out of the home. So I wonder if you foresee a more permanent shift to stay at home labor and 
I, I wonder if you see an increase in the value of labor for jobs that can't be done from home and are considered essential. I think this uh, COVID experience will turn out to have been an accelerator in the sense that it'll move us faster towards what I think we were going for anyway, it, and especially through this new relationship we have with our work situation where many people have now for the first time ever in their lives sat at home and done the job they used to do by getting on a train and going to their office and working with 27 other people and coming back home at five o'clock. And I don't think we'll go back. I mean, there are too many savings to be made if you have that kind of system. People live in their own houses. Uh, you don't have to rent big office space. You don't have to have canteens. You have lots and lots of stuff you save. And yet you get the work done just as well because it's done as it is in the office in a strange way, electronically in most cases. Most people sit at a computer these days. And, and, and I mean, you know, technically speaking, there is no reason for them to have to sit anywhere except in front of a computer and that could be at home. So I think, We'll, we'll never look back in the sense that we will move towards, I mean, people like you and me, people in the communications business have been doing this for some time. I mean, I, I live on my computer. I don't go to an office anywhere. My office is my computer. And I think this, this is the new way. Um, there will still be need for people to do jobs that aren't sitting on computers doing things like construction, like public, public transportation. Um, I'm not sure that that will alter the value of the people doing that work from what it is now. I think there may be more people out there looking for that kind of work because not everybody does work on a computer. A lot of people don't. Question is, you know, if the if the if the if the people who own the companies want to cut back, it's going to be possible to cut back on some of those people who come in, if only to service the people who sit at the computers, like canteens and cleaning and various other things like that. So we, I think we may have a, a temporary period where we see problems concerning how many jobs there are available for what we might have called once unqualified people. But that's coming anyway. That's coming anyway. That's coming with the advance of, you know, artificial intelligence and robotics, which are going to do away with the need for human beings to do certain kinds of jobs completely. And then the long term, I think we have to look at what work is and why we do it and what we get from it and whether or not ultimately, and there's been a couple of experiments, I think, in the States in small areas, whether or not we should look towards the possibility of universal basic income, that you get a basic income, whether you work or not. And that, that basic income is, is slightly like a pension, maybe better, because it gives you enough to live on for you and your family. But you don't necessarily have to have a job. You might have to qualify by proving that you lost your job to a machine and that there was no other way you could have done what you do. But I think that's coming too. Um, I wanted to talk to you about the terrifying outbreak of cholera in London in 1854. Um, obviously, neither of us is anti-science, but the medical establishment, really, they were completely wrong in every way about the cholera epidemic. And ultimately, it was novel thinking and very meticulously gathered data that solved the mystery and arguably uh, was the genesis of epidemiology. Can you tell us what happened there in a nutshell? Yeah, in a nutshell, what happened was that the statistics became important for the first time, and here's why. Cholera turns up in what, 18, the first time in 1830 something, but it really hits big in sort of 1850 in London, um, the biggest city by far in, in the world at the time. And it hits, um, and nobody knows what it is. Now, at the time, medical opinion is that all disease is caused by bad smells or bad air. Uh, malaria, for example, is called that because malaria means bad air. Malaria. So the, the traditional way of dealing with most diseases is to let somebody lose a lot of blood. And one or two other crazy things. That doesn't work. And, and the, the people are dying like flies. And that's something that nobody is capable of. No, medical science at the time can't handle at all. Um, what happens is that there's a, there's, there are a bunch of things called friendly societies, and these are 
kind of trade unions before trade unions, and their job is to take a small amount of money, a few pennies from poor, the workers, and then if they're not well, if they have a child who's ill or something, pay for their care or pay for the time away from work when they're not earning. Friendly societies, they were called. And these people are obviously keen to know how bad things are going to get, to know whether or not they're charging enough premium to then provide the money that everybody needs. And so they're interested in finding out more about why people are dying where they're dying. And one of them is a, is a fellow who trained in France, in, in medicine in France, called Farr. And he becomes very interested in medical statistics. And at the time, around about 1850, the first really detailed statistics start appearing about deaths. You know, I forget that they're called actuarial tables. Who dies where and why and of what? And this allows him to do an analysis of who dies where. And he discovers that many more people are dying near water than further away from it. So he does a kind of map of London and he looks at the number of deaths and where they die and sure enough the big number of deaths happens close to the river and then they begin to say well what's in the river and then they look and then they see what's in the river it's where all the sewage is dumped because there is no sewage system and gradually it becomes clear that what's happening is cholera is carried in contaminated water that is drunk by people because that's where they got their water from the Thames so once they started building sewage alternatives like sewers, it stopped. Um, and that's really what, what it boiled down to, gathering the data about how far above the Thames you stop getting cholera. So it was really statistics that solved that issue. Where people were getting their water from it wasn't wasn't there a, a case where uh, there was uh, two streets and one street was getting all its water from a certain company and the other street yes. was getting... So you had this side-by-side -side comparison where you, you could did. look at the one street and say, you're all getting cholera and you all get your water from you know XYZ water company. Yeah, that's right. And the other side of the street in close proximity, they have less or no cholera, but they're getting their water from someone who's drawing it from a pure source and not the Thames. Yes, yes. And, and, and then this was finally proved by a fellow called John Snow, who said there was a cholera epidemic, particularly bad, around a place called Broad Street, where there was a pump. And he said, if we're right, this pump's doing it. And so they stopped the pump working, and the cholera went away. And they said, hang on, this is a pump pumping water up from an artesian well. How could it get there? They dug down and discovered that the artesian well was being contaminated by seepage of sewage into it. So that just confirmed everything. There you go. Um, one of the one of the sort of amusing and fascinating things for me uh, as a non-British person is the uh, the British government's response to that cholera outbreak uh, and the role that they played in creating this um, modern British cultural identity. This this uh, the stiff upper lip and fair play and jolly good show and um all of this was I, I don't i really don't want to use the word propaganda because that's a loaded word but um all of this was kind of a government campaign it, it wasn't something that sort of bubbled up organically can you talk about that just briefly well i can't yeah i'll talk briefly about it i mean it's victorian values it's, it's victorian values that have to do with how the upper class lived and and it took it took its most obvious form in the creation of what we call public schools what you call private schools some of the great British public schools were founded at this time, A, because they took children away from the cities and so on into schools out in the countryside, so they were less likely to bump into cholera and disease. And then it taught them, according to principles of new, a new kind of Anglican religion called muscular Christianity, um, as part of what was also known as the Great Awakening, which was a kind of revival of, of religious belief in Victorian England. And this included you know, obviously going to church a lot at the schools, every church had its own chapel. And above all, it got the kids out in the open air where they thought disease wouldn't get them. And to do that, they introduced for the first time ever the fact that sports would be part of the curriculum and it would happen every day, every week, whatever you decided. 
and of course those two sports winter foot, foot rugby and summer cricket so everybody became rugby or cricket players and then that whole institutionalized business of fair play and and if you lose be a good loser shake hands it's called stiff upper lip blah blah and this was really i'm not sure it filtered down too much to the lower classes but it was what that was what the government wanted and it was indeed propaganda of course yeah, I just, uh, I always uh, hesitate to use that word just because it, you know, for some people it can be, uh, can be a loaded term, but you know, I, I, I'm certainly not going to argue that point with you. It's, you know, it was propaganda, but good propaganda for a good cause. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we have a lot of places have quarantined for COVID and in those places we've seen uh, pretty much across the board improvements in the quality of air and water because pollution's been reduced since everybody's staying at home and factories aren't operating and so forth. Um, so now that we've had this breath of fresh air, uh, even if we've had it from sticking our heads out the window and inhaling because we're quarantined, um, do you anticipate a renewed appetite for green initiatives or is that something that's just going to get lost in the noise of economic recovery? No, no, I don't think it'll go away. I mean, it, it was we were moving in that direction fairly strongly anyway, <clears throat> as the public, above all, become more and more aware of the value of what's going on in, in laboratories around the world, looking at what nanotechnology can do. And, you know, we are already beginning to buy lots of electric cars. Um, there is in the laboratories already working. One, there are one or two things that make it easier to move towards uh, a carbon neutral world rather than what has been discussed over the last, say, 10 or 15 years, which is, you know, shutting down, uh, shutting down plants that create CO2, cutting back heavily on the old kind of, of massive industries. <clears throat> Nanotechnology offers a possibility to continue to be industrially active while not necessarily pumping more stuff into the atmosphere. Two or three little examples. There is already in the laboratories the means to spray solar cells onto an object in such a way that it will make its own power from any form of radiation, whether it's solar or nighttime. So you spray your car, you don't need batteries, it will run on, 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 on light, of solar energy. There is already in the laboratory an ability to stick one end of a straw into the dirtiest water you can come across and suck clean water out the other end. That's going to be extraordinary for the third world. Third world. There are membranes that can be put over smokestacks that take everything out except clean air. So there, are, there are, I think the public is becoming more and more aware that these opportunities exist, and that we should, and, and that they won't call, they won't demand a, a sort of radical rethink of our industrial situation and therefore i think they'll get more support so uh, another instance in which covid is kind of an accelerating event yes indeed yes mm -hmm. uh, so there have been a lot of people saying that life is never going to return to the way it was and that we'll be living with a a, a new normal do you think that's true in the long term and if so, what are some of the changes that you anticipate? I don't think that there'll be any big, major changes immediately. I think, however, we have become fairly accustomed, first of all, because of the ability to stay at home and work on a computer. I think we've become fairly ready to accept the fact that we don't necessarily have to work from nine till five every day and go to an office or a city in the city center and do that. I think that will reflect itself in the way people behave and the kind of lives they lead when, as I say, millions of people don't have to flood into the city every day and flood out of the I think that will be a permanent change. I'm <clears throat> I think it I think we will take a while to get over this business of distancing, but I think we'll get back to cuddling fairly soon. I mean, let's say a year or two. I mean, I think, I think, I don't mean cuddle, I mean, you know, right up next against people. Um, and I think that won't last very long. I think we'll go back to being crowded if we want to be, because it's fun being crowded. Um, 
you know, <clears throat> cinemas, festivals, that kind of stuff. People like that. But I think there will be an undergoing, an under, an underpinning awareness, which we had lost, oddly enough, of the potential that a pandemic can turn up at any time. Because in fact, if you look at history, you know, we have lived with epidemics of some kind almost every year for the last five or 600 years. They may not necessarily have been very bad in where you live, but somewhere people were dying at a very high rate. And we have, earlier on, of course, we didn't know about that because the press didn't tell us because the press didn't exist or media, telecommunications and so on. But in the last hundred years or so, I think we have tended to slightly ignore that the rest of the world very often is suffering from epidemics, for example, in the third world. So I think the awareness of that might make us a little more prepared for what to do next time around. Let's hope it's taught the government at least how to do that. It certainly would be nice to see the government learning some lessons from what's happening abroad, yeah. um, particularly in the US, which does not have a great track record for paying attention to the rest of the world. So um, I'm going to move myself onto the screen to give you a moment to fiddle with your computer because uh, I understand you you have a little presentation for my next question. Um, I've asked you a number of times to make predictions. And part of what makes these, these shows that you've done 40 years ago so much fun to watch, even today, is that you, you really did a great job of anticipating changes. And um, I mean, obviously I, I enjoy all the little historical facts and the fun stories too. Oh. Um, but how is it done? Uh, can, can you explain the art of prediction to us? Well, there are two things to be said. Well, two, there are 200 things to be said, but let me say a couple. Um, the brain, is it exists primarily to predict because staying alive means making the right decision turning left hiding behind a bush uh, running away marrying the right person there are many many ways in fact i can't think of a single way in which every second of your life you're making the, your brain is making a prediction and allowing you to make a decision about what to do next um you know back the right horse whatever um, the great thing about that is because the way the brain is structured, which is off the top of my head, something like 90 billion brain cells, each one carrying up to 25,000 links with another brain cell. So the number of ways in which a signal can go through that is said to be bigger than the atoms in the known universe. So it's a big thing and everybody's got one. And a nice example of the way the brain acts in this predictive way is, for example, the way you are understanding me now. I mean, if you think about this speak-listen event going on between me and you, there is no time, is there, for you to go into your head, find the word I just said in your lexicon, your dictionary in your head, and see that it makes sense and come back out and listen for the next one. Because if that's what you were doing, if you were all you were doing was accessing in there a lexicon the size of the average 16-year-old's vocabulary, which these days is reckoned to be about 20,000 words. Sounds a lot. There are 414,000 words in the English core language. So you're looking in there through a, a lexicon of 20,000 words. At one millisecond per active neural retrieval, it would be taking you 20 seconds to understand each word of what I'm saying. And you're not doing that, I trust. No. So what, you seem to, what you seem to be doing is using the rules that you know about language, like grammar and syntax, what words can follow each other and what words can't. Plus the look of my face, the muscles on my face, my tone of voice, the way you think I'm going, the subject I'm discussing anyway, and everything else that allows you to run a number of scenarios ahead of me, part of setting up the words, the next word that I might say. And then when I say it, dumping the ones that were wrong and setting up the next set of scenarios and going on doing that as long as I go on doing this, blah, blah, blah. And what that means, of course, interestingly, is that you are giving this interview, my part of it, before I am. Uh, and you're saying what you know what I'm saying before I say it and anything else I might have said. So in a sense, one wonders why you bothered to watch, but there we are. <laughs> so I use this principle to develop over the last few years 
uh, a thing I'm, I've called the K-Web, the Knowledge Web, and I hope you can see it on the screen now. Can you? Uh, give me a moment, and we'll get that up and running. And here it is. Here's the K-Web. OK, good. Now, this K-Web, I, as I say, I've been working on it for some years. As you can see, there are a number of names on the screen linked with each other. And over to one side, there's the name and the biographical details and so on of the man I'm looking at at the moment, who's Mozart. And you see, uh, if I can do it, there's more of his biographical details. No, I won't bother showing you that. Anyway, I have about 2,800 people from history, all of them linked in with each other according to who was important in their life, whether in their work or their own personal life, who they influenced, who were influenced by them, and so on and so forth. So the people who matter. So here, for example, you have Mozart. And I just want to show you how one can go through a series of steps that bring us to the modern world through the ways in which people interact in, in the past. And one of the reasons that that, that that kind of interaction is interesting is that change usually happens because people, when people come together in new ways, they kind of cause one and one to make three. And the outcome is quite often more than the sum of the parts. So quite often it's a surprise. And what I'm trying to do with this knowledge web is to give people the chance to take the many thousands of journeys they can through this 2,800 2, people linked 20,000 ways by seeing how it happened in the past. So let's, for example, take Mozart. Mozart stole the idea of the marriage of Figaro from a French uh, playwright called Beaumarchais. Now, Beaumarchais also helped to launder the money across the Atlantic to help uh, you Americans in the so-called War of Independence. And, we appreciate that. Uh, for that reason, he was a big pal of Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson, liberal, liberal thinker, um, interview, uh, sorry, in, 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 influenced by the thinking of an Italian uh, philosopher called Beccaria. Uh, the thing about Beccaria is he wrote the first book about penology. Why do we put people in prison, he said. And if a person kills and we execute them, why do we kill in order to kill the killer? Uh, he was influenced in turn by a couple of people in Vienna called Garland Spurzheim, who invented what is called um, uh, head bump reading. And this became wildly popular in the 19th century because if you could read the bumps on a person's head, theoretically, it said, you could tell the size of the organs under the skull. These organs were criminality, you know, gentleness, uh, uh, amativity, you know, whatever, whatever character you want. And if there was a bump, that was a, a, an extra well-developed thing. So if you find a very big bump of criminality, you'd know the guy was a criminal and you could maybe do something to change this person's character, which interested uh, social reformers like a German called Follen, who was so keen on the whole thing that he got very excited and was put in jail for, well, they tried to put him in jail for like violent action, public action. And he went up before a judge to be judged, a man called E.T.A. Hoffman, who in his spare time wrote creepy stories about the dead coming out of their graves to eat you in the middle of the night. And these stories profoundly influenced Edgar Allan Poe, who wrote his own creepy stories. And Poe, one of Poe's stories was taken as a, as a theme by Rachmaninoff in one of his, I think, concertos or, or, or operas. And Rachmaninoff was at a party in Long Island one day, and he met another young Russian in America working on something that so impressed Rachmaninoff, he gave the guy 5,000 bucks, which in 1923 is a lot of money, which allowed Sikorsky to develop uh, the helicopter. Voila. So Mozart to the helicopter in 10 unusual and unexpected jumps. I finished uh, that's, the that's, that's amazing. So what I'm trying to show there is, is how, above all, change comes along quite often in the least expected ways. I, I, a wonderful example I enjoy, if I could just to take two seconds to tell you this one. I mean, uh, in, in, in 1705, uh, un came the political union of Scotland with England. And the big deal was what this allowed was the Scottish whiskey makers to get access to the thirsty American market. And so they got very excited about trying to get more bang for their buck and more profit from the American market. So they went to a fellow called Black who taught physics at Edinburgh University in Scotland and said, how can we find a way to use less fuel, but to boil up the same amount of mash to make the same amount of steam to then distill into wonderful whiskey and save money on the fuel. So he did a lot of work into all that stuff. And he came up with knowing why steam is as hot as it is. He called it latent heat. And this is what allowed Black to tell the university repairman 
how to repair his bit of technology and make it work better. The repairman was called James Watt, the technology was his pump, and it became a steam engine, and uh, hence, bingo, thanks to whiskey, you get the Industrial Revolution. Uh, I think probably thanks to whiskey, we've gotten many things over the years. So. <laughs> um, I, I have to deviate just for a second because uh, I, I, I do see a comment from somebody that's asking if your, your K-Web uh, is accessible to the public. Is that just a private tool that you use or is that something that's online for other people to use as well? Yes, it's not, not online yet because I haven't finished it. It's almost finished, but there are versions of it available. If you go to www.k-web, that's k-web.org, O-R-G. And there's a bunch of people at the University of California running that for me. And they're delighted if you get, get in touch with them. All right. Okay. I've just... Uh... I should say one last thing. My main aim when it's finished, and that should be in the next year or so, is to make it available, of course, free, because I'd love to have it being used in schools and maybe first year universities to teach people to think laterally. So it's not, it, it won't cost. Excellent, excellent. I'm sure people are looking forward to that and I know I'll enjoy playing around with it as well. Mm. Um, I, I wanted to talk about a, a theme that's really common through a lot of your shows which is about the rate of change. And the rate of change in technology is greater now than any other time in human history. How do we ensure that our ethics and our legal system and our other aspects of our society keep up with this uh, pace of technological change? That's a very difficult question because um, the trouble with technology and the speed with which it brings change is that change challenges the institutional nature of our society. And our institutions, I think about politics, uh, finance, education, medicine, the, the major institutions in our society come from a history of a point at, the, at some time in the past when they were created in order to deal with a particular kind of problem. So our institutions are a product of the past, dealing with the issues of the past according to the values of the past. For example, a wild generalization, but I believe it, uh, parliamentary democracy is the answer to bad roads and no telecommunications. You find a way for somebody, for somebody to represent a number of you, and then he or she take the long and difficult journey to the capital and then stay there and represent your point of view as well as they can until it's time to come back again and say, did you notice what I got for you? And will you vote for me again? Now, that, that's variously back as far as it could be, I suppose, the 13th century in Britain. But that institution solved problems that we no longer need to solve. And that's why, I'm gonna be rude now, that's why our country, Britain, is run by a bunch of people in a large wooden room shouting at each other. Now, when you have computers like, like Frontera, one of the new ones, capable of doing a quintillion operations a second, to dealing with every decision you've ever made in your life in one second, with the ability to access pretty much any knowledge you need instantly, there are other ways to run society than with um, 17th century parliamentary democracy. And this is true, I think, of, of increasingly most of our institutions. It goes back to what we were saying earlier about the, about the, the fact that, 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 that doing things using human beings is going to be too slow. I mean, if you think, I'll go out on a limb here, if you think about this COVID issue and you look at the news reports about everybody working very, very hard indeed all over the world to try and find a vaccine, what you see is what you would have seen 100 years ago, people tipping liquids into little gas tubes and then looking at them through microscopes and blah, blah, blah. There is one, as far as I know, maybe more, there's one program that's throwing the problem into a very, very big computer and saying, look at the molecular structure of this thing and see the kinds of things that we ought to be doing to try and stop it working. And I don't know whether that computer will come up with the answer or not, but you see what I'm saying, that, that, that we will increasingly in society have to accept 
the fact that we don't do things with human beings. We do things with computers. And at best, what we do is make a decision about what we want the computer to do. Now, that is a political decision. And how we do that is a subject I can go on for hours about, but it doesn't necessarily mean sitting in a big wooden room yelling at each other. Government by computer. Government by uh, direct democracy. Okay. Interesting. Well, it'll take me into a couple of areas I, I'm happy to talk about, if you like, big data and predictive analytics. Let's save the big data for a different question. Okay. But predictive analytics, by all means, go ahead. Well, um, two things. Sometime, I think, in the early 18th century, there's a marvelous uh, French physicist called Laplace, and he said, you want me to predict everything? No problem. Tell me everything. And, of course, nobody ever could. With mega computers growing faster and bigger by the hour, we are now almost in a, in a situation where we can pretty much collect all the data that remotely relates to a situation and chuck in the algorithms and see what patterns there are in the data and what those patterns tell us. I've not really understood this properly, but I'll have a go at it. Back in 1950-something, a, a, a statistician came up with some stuff called called decision trees. And he said, making a decision about whether or not people will behave in a certain way is like a tree with a branch on it, which has twigs on it, which have leaves on it, which has a leaf on it. And as you go down towards that leaf, you, 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 you refine the number of people involved who've been through the previous stages to get to that. Thing. And then you look at what they're doing, and that'll tell you where most of those people are going to go in terms of what their behavior will be. In other words, it's kind of behavioral prediction. If you are capable of using predictive analytics to throw the algorithm into the sea of data about people, you will be able to find out well, how they really want to live, what they really want to do. And, and to do that, I mean, there's a lot of shouting going on at the moment with tracing and tracking and all that about losing privacy, as if we hadn't already lost it. I mean, at least for 15 years, we've been capable of, of following what's called data exhaust. And that's what happens every time you buy something, use your credit card, buy a ticket, uh, see a doctor, buy a pair of shoes, travel somewhere. I mean, everything we do, including, of course, everything we do on a computer, every time you click, uh, the information is available to say what you clicked. Now, at the very crudest level, this is why some companies can say to you when you're buying something from them online, you might also want to look at this. Not because they're guessing, but because they followed what you've done so far, and they know that 99% you're going to look for that. And this can translate very easily into what we might do in order to run our society without men in a room shouting at each other. Because this is the way that you find out what people want. I mean, what the way people live tells you what they want. The way people spend their money, what they do, how they enjoy themselves. These all add up to what people want life to be like. And what you do in predictive analytics is put all that together and discover what everybody wants and then look at a way in which you can run society providing as much as possible what everybody wants. This is supposed to be what politicians do, but they don't. And it's one prime reason why they don't. In Britain, there are, what, 60 million people. To suggest that 60 million people's desires, wishes of life, about life, can be dealt with adequately through three alternatives, Labour, uh, Conservative and, and, and Lib Dem, is crazy. I mean, you know, 50, 60 million people have many, many more requirements that can be met by three ways of doing it. Maybe three million ways of doing it, maybe even 30 million ways, but not three. That's what I mean about replacing the men in a box shouting at each other. In a sense, you almost know how people are going to vote before they vote with the predictive analytics, if it's good enough. I mean, the thing is, you don't ask them to vote because there's nothing to vote for. All you say, all you say is nothing. I mean, you say, we think, if you say anything, you say, we've arranged for life to be like this for you. Is that right? And the answer comes back saying, you bet. Because with predictive analytics,
politics, you're close to being really producing what the person really wants to live like. How society functions physically out in the world, that's, that's what the computer gets on with to arrange. Um, you know, like if nobody wants to go on a bus ever again, then you dump the buses. And one of the things you do out there is to say, okay, no more buses, everybody, stop making them. So, you know, it's, not, it's, not, it's going to be, it, we're not even going to be asked because we have been asked. Well, no, we've been telling in the ways that we spend and move and love and behave and go and whatever. The, the data exhaust is us telling what we want. Well, I know one of the things you're very keen on is nanotechnology. Uh, I saw a speech you gave on YouTube in which you envisioned a machine that could replicate essentially anything, um, including itself. And in the US, we already have uh, the government cracking down on 3D printers that are uh, capable of making guns and gun parts. And uh, thinking about the world's uh, economic system, if you could just make an unlimited supply of gold, that would certainly have a big impact on that. And if you no longer need to buy consumer goods, what happens to the companies that make those consumer goods? So in all of that, my real question is, would the people in power ever allow such a machine to even exist? That's a nice 19th century question. <laughs> uh, the people in power are, are dealt with by hackers. The hacker always wins. So I don't think there's any question of the people in power being able to prevent nanotechnology occurring. Let me say a little bit about nanotechnology in response to what you were saying about the things it would do. I mean, nanotechnology basically, a nanofabricator is what I was really talking about. And this is a machine that takes an, an atom and puts it together with another atom to make a molecule. So you take, for example, two uh, uh, atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen, and you get H2O, which is water. And you can do that with everything except one or two, well, pretty much. And the th key thing about this is that a nanofabricator will get those atoms from essentially 90 something, 98% of what, what, what the nanofabricator needs to make these things, from essentially um, uh, earth, sorry, dirt, air, and water. And then what you need is a sort of micro, 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 micro factory to push these things together, to get the, the atoms together into a little clump, and then to make the molecules get together in clumps to make stuff and then put the stuff together to make things. So that's, that's a nanofabricator and it's coming because two years ago at the University of Manchester, the first piece of equipment that would move those little atoms together to make a molecule was developed and it's working and they're moving ahead. My guess is, I'd say 40 years, it'll probably be 30 or, or 50, but it's in that ballpark. And when you have a nanofabricator, you are entirely autonomous. Um, you, you know, it, it'll make anything, as you said, anything you want. Food, clothing, building, heat, power, telecommunication equipment, you name it, it'll make it. All you have to do is to give it the, the, the as it were, the, the molecular structure to aim for, to make. Which means, of course, you can live anywhere you like. You can live on a mountain, you can live in Antarctica. No pollution, of course, no, because the pollution goes back in the machine and it's cleaned up. Uh, no, no, anything really. I mean, you've got everything you absolutely everything you need. At that time, we presume, you know, we'll be able to interact with other human beings holographically. If you want, you can have your old granny to dinner and she can sit across the table from you. And unless you try to accidentally hug her and put your arm right through her, she's there and anybody else you want. You can turn your house or whatever it is into the Globe Theatre and watch Shakespeare plays with holographic actors doing, a, doing their thing. You can do anything you like. You can be in touch, as we've learned in this recent COVID situation, you can be in very close touch with people electronically quite easily. What happens when we don't need any money, when we don't need any companies? You see, the thing about who gets laid off when, when a company that makes something nobody wants anymore, and anyway, there's no money, they don't get laid off. They themselves have nanofabricators, so they don't need a job. The interesting thing is what will happen when we all live like that, when there are no value systems worth anything. I mean, you know, you want gold, make gold. You want the Mona Lisa, make a perfect copy of the Mona Lisa. 
You want to be rich beyond your dreams? What would you like? Have it for nothing. The question is, what are we going to do with our brains? And I suppose an optimist would say, and I say this because the pessimists jump out of a window and they're no longer involved. Optimists would say it's a wonderful opportunity for people to be creative in a way that people have never been able to before. So that you can sit there and think of something absolutely wonderful and have your nanofabricator make it and then show it to people. And if they want it, send them a copy. So, you know, the optimist says this could be the re a renaissance like never seen before. So I'm, I'm for it, not against it, because, as I say, pessimists jump out of the window and are no longer involved. Yeah, I'd say I'm for it, too. I would certainly like the ability to have anything I want at my fingertips. So um, I want to go back to, to Connections and you know the other shows that you've done. One of the things that I really love about those shows is that you talk about people uh, and the discoveries they made. And these people didn't have university credentials. And in many cases, they didn't even have a background in the thing that they discovered or invented. Uh, some of those discoveries were ridiculed or suppressed by mainstream science. In particular, uh, I'm thinking of the continental drift theory, which was invented by a uh, meteorologist, if I remember correctly. So everybody, uh, everybody mocked him for 30 years. And then finally they came around and said, Hey, uh, you know, looks like you were right about that whole continental drift thing. Um, and it seems to me as a layman, uh, in today's world, science has become even more orthodox and there's even less room for uh, novel thinking or dissenting theories. And it seems like fewer discoveries are coming from noodlers, as you've affectionately called them on the show. Um, is my take on that right? Or have we just kind of run out of things that people can discover unless they have a laboratory and funding grants and things of that nature? Well, people do, you see, people do. I mean, I think with what is happening in computers, it is becoming increasingly likely that in a not a very long time, I don't know how many years, 30, 20, 50, people will have the capability of using computers in a way they just about do, some of us now, but most not yet, of saying to the computer, like saying, you know, Siri, invent me something. No. Or, you know, I, I think it would be a very good idea to produce a thing that does this, um, and I don't know how to do it, but I know what I wanted to do. So here's a detailed list of the outcome of what you'll do. Now go and do it. And whoever she is, Siri or somebody, goes off to mag a massive computer, uses all the knowledge on the planet, comes back and says, is this what you want? And you say, well, I'd like to change this and that and that. So you can, I think, be creative. Um, I think in the old world of people doing things, you were right in saying, that science has become extraordinarily precise and specialized, niche oriented, where, you know, to be a great success, be the only person in your field who knows what to do. Well, that is going to very rapidly be superseded by what computers can do. So I think the potential for innovative thinking will be enhanced enormously because I keep going back to, no, I don't keep going back to, but I want to go back to this fact that we all have a brain with more connections in it than there are atoms in the known universe. And it's got to do something. I mean, the reason people aren't brilliant is not that they're not brilliant. It's that our educational systems, naturally enough, have been capable of teaching brains to do um, a zillionth of what the brains can do, because that's, that, that's something we can teach people with the technology we've had up until now. You know, tick the right box know that two and two equals four, speak a foreign language. These are all wonderful, uh, up to the 19th century, wonderful and valuable tools, but not much longer. So the noodlers will be uh, noodling with Siri or whoever the next uh, digital assistant is. I, I, I think that I keep on going back to it. I go back to it again. I, you know, if you leave, leave people in a room for long enough with a big piece of paper and nothing to do but noodle and say, think up something, 
if you encourage them in the right way, they'll do it. They'll do it. I mean, I think everybody has the same sized brain as Einstein. It's the educational system that cannot deal with that. It will. It will, because very shortly, very shortly, we're going to start having avatars instead of real human beings who are on your screen and who are so realistic you have no idea they're not human beings. I mean, I might be one right now. The difference between me and an avatar is inside the avatar is all the knowledge on the planet. Inside me, there's only my knowledge. And that means that the avatar can teach each kid idiosyncratically the, exactly the way that kid would best be taught. So the kid wouldn't sit in a, a classroom thinking I'm stupid because I don't, uh, I don't click with this way of learning it. The kid would be doing it the way the kid wants to. And I think that's going to cause the biggest revolution in history when it happens. And it's going to happen in the next 15 to 20 years. Wow. Wow. So, I, so, I mean, I mean, my next question ties into, ties into uh, the education system in a way. Um, you've talked a lot about how people who have invented things um, have actually borrowed pieces of other inventions or they've just outright stolen ideas. Uh, you talked about how Charles Darwin may have stolen the idea of survival of the fittest from somebody um, who wasn't a scientist, he was a layman. Um, and Thomas Edison famously took credit for uh, a lot of work that was just done by people who were toiling in his lab. Um, so when we have a science text, and it presents invention as the uh, eureka moment of one individual rather than sort of describing this collaborative process of, of borrowing bits or stealing bits from other people. It, 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 are the textbooks doing us a disservice by presenting invention and science in that fashion, that eureka fashion? You better. I mean, let me do a couple of three eurekas. Um, I mean, as you said, Edison. I mean, without a, an unknown German called Sprengel, who invented a vacuum pump to get the air out of Edison's light bulb, it wouldn't have worked. Morse didn't invent the Morse code. The, the little guy doing his wiring, who was called Vail, did that. Uh, the Wright brothers got all their aeronautics from a French expert called Octave Chanou, nobody's ever heard of. Gutenberg probably got hold of a bit of Korean block printing to show him how to do it. Uh, a Polaroid camera came from not Edwin Land, but a little guy called William Bird Herapath, who discovered a kind of crystal by putting together, because he was a chemist, iodine with dog urine. Worked that one out. So there are all kinds of strange, less important people back there who did what. But above all, what I want to say is when you teach history as a series of acts by great people, special, different people, what you're doing is telling your children that you're teaching that you may not be one of them. The chances are you're not, because there are very few of them and many, many, many of you. And that's the greatest disservice we can give any child and give any brain. Agreed, agreed. Speaking of uh, borrowing ideas and borrowing things, um, Martin Luther famously wrote hymns that were set to the tunes of popular drinking songs because he reckoned everybody already knew the music. And uh, Americans, I think, would be shocked to learn that the music for the American national anthem is actually a British drinking song. Can you briefly, uh, can you briefly recap that story for us and then tell us, uh, uh, did nobody at the time figure this out or did it just not bother them? Uh, tell us well, the story. Yeah, well, well the, the basic piece of music was originally written for a gentleman's drinking and singing club in London called the Anacreontic Society. Now, Anacreontic Society was a society dedicated to the memory of a Greek writer and bon viveur called Anacreon. And the song is called Anacreon in Heaven. That's to say he's up there watching us doing all this singing for him. I was written by a fellow with the surprising English name of Smith. Now, the point of all this drinking and singing was because that's what you did in 1766 in downtown London, uh, and it was all very, you know, good fun. It's where glee clubs first began. The song, the music, and the words were actually published in 1788, and a year, ten years later, I think one of the signers of the Declaration, Robert Treat Payne, used the music to write 
words called for a song called Adams and Liberty. Nobody's ever heard of it. And then in 1812, of course, Francis Scott Key wrote a song called The Defense of Fort McHenry and set it to Anacreon in Heaven. And only a bit later, people started to use words from the song and called the song The Star Spangled Banner. So a lot of people knew about it. In fact, the Star Spangled Banner sat around being sung here and there all over America for a long time. It wasn't adopted as a national anthem until 1931. So by that time, people people were singing. But they were singing it the way you sing. They used to sing folk songs or vaudeville songs. It was just a song everybody sang. Um, the fact that it was written by a, a, a Brit called Smith and rewritten by another one called Payne. I mean, it sort of didn't matter. Why should it? All right. Um, the next question is is really it's kind of complicated, um, and I'm gonna so I'm gonna speak slowly so that everybody has time to sort of absorb it. Um, you know, people that have seen your shows, I think, will will pick up on it fairly quickly. But for those few who haven't, um, this is a little bit of a, a mind bender. So something that you've demonstrated on your shows is that even something that we regard as sort of the gold standard of irrefutable proof, uh, our sensory input, the things that we can see with our own two eyes, uh, that all of that is subjective. And something as pure as what we see, our minds can only interpret by uh, using the facts as we understand them. And if we see something with our eyes that doesn't fit our understanding of the world, what our mind does is creates a new interpretation of what we see to match our facts. It actually changes what we're seeing rather than updating our facts to match what it is that we actually see. And in learning that from your show, one of the questions that I've always had is that mental process of, of uh, not updating your facts, but rather changing the interpretation of what you're seeing. Is that sort of mental process purely confined to sensory input, or does it also prevent us from accepting concepts or data that are in conflict with our understanding of the facts? Yes, they have been they're both linked. Let me first start by saying your, your, your eyes don't see things, they see signals, and the brain says what the signals are. Um, the, the prime thing to say about what we see and whether it's pure or not, and whether it's related to what we think things are in terms of concepts as well as anything else, can be clearly illustrated with the fact that every morning you wake up and I wake up and we all wake up and we watch the sun come up. It doesn't, never has, never will. I mean, it doesn't come up. We go round. Now, I've known that since I was a tiny kid and so have you, that we are on a spinning globe and we spin ourselves into a point where we can start to see the sun. That still doesn't alter the fact that my brain says that's the sun coming up. Sun doesn't come anywhere. But it was what was happening to perfectly good sense too, doesn't it? And it was what ruled the universe before Copernicus. I mean, before Copernicus, the Earth was the center of the universe and everything went around it. And then along comes Copernicus and risks who knows what by saying, hey, wait a minute, that's not true. You know, there's a thing called the solar system and we are just one planet in it. The Earth is no longer, you know, the center of God's attention, which is what the church said it was. And that's why he got into such deep doo-doo uh, until, you know, Galileo comes along and looks up at Jupiter and says, I can see moons going around Jupiter, which proves that there are many places where things go round and we're just one of them. So this kind of rules the way we move. I, I, I mean, representative democracy, you know, the way we used to see things being done um, still rules us. Um, uh, Language, for example, I mean, you know, a concept of love means something entirely different, same word, same language, to Chaucer, 
uh, Jane Austen and Hollywood. I mean, and that happens in almost, with almost every word in the vocabulary, that's true. Um, before, before Charles I, God, uh, kings were divine. Then they chopped his head off and set up the Commonwealth, and we no longer regarded kings as divine, but as constitutional monarchs. So, you know, things, innovation causes things to change, and we then adapt to fit. Sometimes not well, and sometimes we hang on to what used to be thought to be true uh, until we are obliged by force to, to leave, I mean, or, or circumstances. I like, again, parliamentary democracy. You know, we, we are now spending half the time telling ourselves how wonderful parliamentary democracy is, which seems to me, is an indication to me, that it's time to rethink. It might be. It definitely might be. Um, I have a couple of questions left. We're a little over time. Can we keep you or do you have another obligation? Uh, it depends how difficult it is. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, tr I'll try to pitch you some soft I, I, I have to tell you, it's 10 o'clock at night here too, so. Yes, yes. Um, well, if we can keep you for a little bit, I'll, I'll ask yeah, you just sure. a few more questions. Sure. Um, you, you spoke about astronomy, which is um, one of many fields. There's so much of our core science is based on what Islamic scholars discovered or on what they rediscovered from antiquity that had been previously lost. And a lot of that scholarship took place in medieval Spain, specifically in Al-Andalus where Muslims, Christians, and Jews lived and studied together. Um, I actually vacationed there, and I was struck by the, the pride that Spanish people feel even today uh, for the reconquest, which brought an end to Moorish rule in the late 15th century. What happened to all of that scholarship and coexistence in Spain once the church was back in charge? Yeah, well, um, I, I, I have a couple of things about what you've said. 90% of what the Muslims brought was actually ancient Greek knowledge um, because a bunch of people who were slightly uh, off the wall in terms of belief were called Nestorians, Christians, and they were chucked out of Constantinople because of their beliefs and they went to a place called Jundi Shapur in the middle of the mountains of Iran, what is now Iran. And at nearby Baghdad, the the, the, uh, the guy in charge got some terrible stomach bug and the doctors couldn't fix it. And somebody said, there's some people up in the mountains who seem to know quite a lot. So they went up and said, can you fix him? And he, they came down and said, yeah, this is what you need to take and it'll go away. And it did. And he said, what can I do for you? And they said, nothing. He said, well, can I look at your library? And they said, sure. So he then set up a translation outfit and took almost everything out of their library and translated it into Arabic. And when everybody went west, in the following couple of 300 years, they took this knowledge with them and included, ended up in, in Andalusia and above all in Cordoba. And as you say, the Reconquista chucked them out and that was the end of them. What happened to the knowledge? Well, the Catholic Church um, had always, you know, kept pretty tight control on what you could not couldn't talk about. But not much happened because you see, by the time the Reconquista happened in the 15th century, the, the system set up in, the, in northern Spain um, during the Moorish occupation, uh, there was a system set up to start thinking about how to turn all this Moorish knowledge into knowledge in Latin that we would understand. And institutions were formed in order to create that body of knowledge out of Arabic knowledge. And these, these institutions became known as universities. So by the time of the Reconquista, there, was, there were many universities all over Europe, already 150 years in, and doing very nicely, thank you. Yes, of course, there was trouble from time to time from the church. I mean, in 1215, the Catholic Church shut down the University of Paris for quite a while because it was talking stuff that the church didn't agree with. But gradually, as I said earlier in our conversation, the hacker wins. So gradually, the ways were found around. For example, when Copernicus published, his editor said, all we have to do is to say that what you're talking about up there in the sky is a kind of mathematical fiction, it's not real, and that let him off the hook. And there were ways of doing that all the time. So um, the church kind of got 
people got around the problems of the church until it stopped being problems, you know, in, you know, in the Renaissance and from then on. So we did okay, thanks to those institutions set up to translate all that stuff called universities, from which we have all benefited. That uh, story about the Caliph al-Mansur in Baghdad, that's probably one of my favorite stories from Connections, and I've told it to many people. It's, it's right. really quite a brilliant story. Uh, yeah. I, I recall in your show, you talked about how after the reconquest, uh, the, the Spanish only allowed Jews to be money lenders. Yes. And uh, so people borrowed money from Jews because that was the only profession that they were allowed into. And if you didn't feel like paying back the loan, all you had to do was say, hey, I saw that Jewish guy eating meat on Friday and they would burn him at the stake and your debt would go up in smoke along with the Jewish person who loaned you the money. That didn't just happen in Spain, that happened all over Europe. So uh, certainly, uh, you know, difficult times, I think, for, for Muslims and Jews once the church yes. was, was back in control. Yes, it must be said that the Muslim uh, ethos in, in, in Muslim Spain was fantastic. I mean, they, as you said yourself, they worked happily with Christians and Jews uh, at all times. Uh, 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 not quite freedom of thought, but almost. Yeah, it's a, it's a, people always sort of seem to have their mind blown when I explain to them how many uh, words, just scientific words, algebra, I mean, that's Arabic. So uh, I, I spoke... I have to tell you something silly, nothing to do with this conversation. We have a marvelous stand-up comedian in Britain, and he said the other day, why should I learn algebra? I have no intention of going there. <laughs> nice, very nice. Um, you know, I've, I've praised your success rate so much during this interview. Um, and so I feel comfortable asking about one of your predictions that maybe didn't quite hit the mark yet. Um, you talked about this concept of a virtual assistant that could basically stand in place of a person, um, reminding them of uh, birthdays, suggesting gifts for uh, the person whose birthday it was, uh, paying bills. Um, talking to somebody else's virtual assistant and saying, you know, hey, my guy can't make this meeting. When's the next time your guy can make the meeting? And working it, working it out amongst themselves, the virtual assistants, and then coming back to you and saying, hey, your 5 p.m. on Wednesday has been moved to a 3 p.m. on Friday. Um, and I, I don't, I don't know that I, I don't think we've seen that yet. But one of the things that you pointed out when you made that prediction is that we would really have to sacrifice a lot of privacy in order for that to come to pass. So right now there's this current of distrust for big data. Um, do you feel like that current of distrust uh, means we'll never have this virtual assistant? Or have we already given up so much privacy that the virtual assistant uh, may well appear in, in the nearest future? The problem is we use this word privacy or privacy uh, in, in, in terms more, more, uh, more fitted to the late 19th century than now. I mean, first of all, as I said earlier, many aspects of what we used to call privacy, like where I spend my money, what I like to buy, where I go with my holidays, where I go with my girlfriend, what I do when I see the doctor, those things, that's already known because of that data exhaust that we leave behind that I said earlier, which is usable in terms of predictive analytics to see where we're going next. So in that sense of the word, we've lost what used to be called privacy or privacy already, and it doesn't matter. The, the, the thing, I mean, the silliest example of privacy, I think, and I think it very well represents this old fashioned view people have. Uh, at one point in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, I think in the 19th century, yes, 19th century, it was announced that people were going to have numbers on their houses, and people screamed and yelled and went out on the streets and shouted, privacy, privacy. You know, if you put a number on my house, everybody will know where I live. And the government said, would you like your mail delivered or not? And they said, oh, okay. <laughs> so, A, you know, we, we choose aspects of privacy that matter to us in sometimes rather silly ways. 
But the prime thing to say about these personal assistants, A, I think we will have them within, within 15 years, was that when my personal assistant talks to your personal assistant about what it is we're doing together and arranging our diaries or whatever, some of the time they won't be talking about me and you, they'll be talking about my computer at home and your computer and the work that we are doing together, which will actually be being done by our computers according to the way we'd like. And these conversations will go on between the assistants and them and the computers. I don't see why not with absolutely total security. I mean, you know, one of the one of the things we all know is going to go on being a, a growth industry is cyber security um, because out there there's always a hacker. So I'm not too worried about that situation. I have some fan questions to ask you because as you've probably guessed by now i'm a huge fan of the connections and uh, the day of the universe changed in your your other shows so um in those shows you you rode a snowmobile you stood on top of a concord jet you you hacked at a side of meat with a long sword uh you just did a lot of crazy stuff and I've always been curious if there was something that you wanted to do where the producers or the financiers or the network stepped in and said, James, no, you, you can't do that. It's uh, it's just too dangerous. Well, first of all, I've always produced my own stuff, so there was never a producer to refer to. In my case, it was mostly the BBC who would sometimes, if they ever did, say something like, why are you choosing to do that? But they never did. I mean, you know, the great thing about the Beeb is they left you to do what you wanted to do, and if it failed, you'd never work again. So, you know, they had their own their own ways of controlling you. They did mutter a little bit when I said that we, I and the crew, wanted to go up in what's called the Vomit Comet, which is the airplane that um, NASA uses to train astronauts to spend time in zero gravity. And what it does is it flies along, and then it dives, and at the bottom of the curve, it curves back up again, and then it climbs again, and as it climbs and goes over the top, up equals down in terms of force, and there is no gravity on the plane, and you float for about 40 seconds. And their problem was, the insurers said, is this plane qualified to commercial airline levels of safety? And the BBC said, we thought, we think it might not be. So I had to write a piece of paper that said, I waive my right. And then we went and went and did it, and we stayed up there for hours having this wonderful experience. I should add, at the end of it all, at the, at the base of the stage, we came off, and a local reporter came up and said, "What was it like?" And I said, "It was the second most exciting thing I've ever done." And she went on to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the? Uh, I'm not going to make that mistake. What's the first most exciting thing you've ever done? I'm done business. <laughs> Sorry. Mind your own business. <laughs> Very well. Point well taken, sir. Um, I, have you know, the, I have to go now. <laughs> you, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I only have one more question. Right. Um, so uh, these days, uh, fans of older TV series, uh, you know, they've had some luck. They can't always get networks to produce a new season of their favorite show. Uh, but sometimes they wind up with a, a two-hour special or a movie or something like that. Have you, have you given any thought to doing a Connections special? No, I'm doing a new Connections series. It'll come out in January 2022. This is me with my mind being blown. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am terribly excited about that. So, uh, um, wow. So, uh, Connections 4, then. Right. Well, it'll be, it'll be called Connections Twenty One. Connections Twenty One. Okay. And uh, will we be seeing this in America? Oh yes, yes. You will, of course. Yes, yes. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I, that's uh, fantastic <laughs> news. You've thrown me off my game. That's how uh -huh. excited I am. Um, right. So I'm going to ask you one more question, but before I do, I'm going to ask your indulgence for sixty seconds. Um, I've seen probably, by a conservative estimate, about a thousand hours of your programs, oh my God. Um, which I didn't tell you before the interview because I was worried you would think I'm a crazy stalker. Um, so I've seen a lot of, 
Yeah, okay. Well, you're almost done. You're almost out of the woods. Um, I've noticed some patterns and just some things that seem to crop up often in your shows. And as a fan, um, in a good-natured spirit, I've invented a James Burke drinking game. And if you'll indulge me for 60 seconds, I'd just like to play the video of the James Burke drinking game. So um, let me just add my screen here and um, Number one. Uh, we'll do the, the James Burke drinking game. So um, this is something, uh, you know, people uh, might enjoy during the pandemic. I'll say it's uh, something that should be done in, uh, in moderation and with friends. And uh, anyway, here it is. Rule number one, when James Burke is shown using a tool, you take a drink. Rule number two, when James Burke is shown operating his own vehicle, you take a drink. Rule number three, when James Burke uses the phrase power of some screw, power of some screw, you take a drink. Rule number four, when James Burke asks a question and then answers it himself, you still take a drink. Right? Right. Rule number five, when James Burke is somewhere obviously dangerous, you take a queasy sip, but you still take a drink. Rule number six, when James Burke drinks, everybody yells drink, and the last person to yell drink has to take a drink. So there we are. Thank you for indulging me in my silliness. <laughs> okay, she, she I'll, I'll be in touch. She's my lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> uh, you're a barrister, I assume you mean. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, the last thing I, I want to ask you is just uh, tell us what you're working on right now. You mentioned Connections 21. Do you have any other projects that you'd like to tell us about or things you're working on? I'm writing the book which on which the series would be uh, based. I always do that, write the book first. I, I, and I'm doing stuff for BBC Radio because the nice thing about that is you can do it down the line and I can do it from here in France and I don't have to go to London to do it. So I'm keeping busy. Good. Very good. Well, I'm sure everybody is uh, excited and looking forward to your, your new projects. I want to thank you so much for your time today. This has been absolutely fantastic uh, for me and for the viewers. Um, I'll ask you to just stay in the studio uh, as I end the broadcast. We'll, we'll sure. chat for just a moment when it's done. But uh, uh, viewers, uh, uh, you have a lot to look forward to now and uh, certainly hope you all enjoyed this interview as much as I enjoyed giving it. So uh, good afternoon, or uh, if you're watching from James Burke's area, good evening. And uh, I'll end the broadcast and then we'll, we'll chat just for a moment. So uh, goodbye, folks.